Here, this collection of the Richard and Judy Book Club podcast has zipped past. We're already on to our final recommendation. Well, they've been great books, and we've saved just a laugh or two until the last. Ah, yes, I like this one, and I very much enjoyed meeting the author. If physically turning pages is a thing of the past for you, we have some great ebook offers for your Kobo. Have a look at the website. Hello, my name is Sinead Moriarty, and I've written the book called Mad About You. I stood in the shower trying to wash away my shame and misery. As the water cascaded over me, I tried to calm down. I didn't know if it was anger, embarrassment or stress. Or perhaps it was a combination of all three, but I couldn't stop shaking. Shivering, I stepped out and wrapped myself in my telling robe. I crawled under my duvet and rang Lucy. I needed my friend. I needed to talk to her and to tell her what a mess I'd made and ask her for advice and have her soothe me with her wise words. But her phone rang into voicemail. I love the way that Sinead uh, combines sort of uh, some real darkness in this story um, and and jeopardy with humour. She's very, very good at writing the two almost simultaneously. You know, one minute you're thinking, oh, my God, what's happening? What what, what does this message mean? It's really threatening. And the next you turn the page and she's just written a one-liner, usually in dialogue, Mm. which makes you laugh. In fact, of of, of all the writers who uh, we've been reviewing in these podcasts, I do think that her dialogue is is amongst the strongest. It's very good. It's very real Mm. Um, and very Irish, you know. Well, I was... I was going to say, I mean, Irish female novelists, I mean, we just look at Marion Keyes, they have, they're brilliant at kind of combining a a strong emotional pull uh, and background with the most enormously witty Hmm. one-liners, which really have you laughing out loud, and Sinead's like that. Yes, she is, and she always has been. All her books are like that. They've all all got a strong element. However, sometimes dark the storyline or disturbing the storyline, there's always a strong element of humour, which kind of saves the day almost, and it's the Mm. rays of sunshine. Um, I also think she writes very well about uh, a young Irish woman coming to live in in, in London, you know, Mm. and the the huge cultural change that 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 would bring. She also writes very well about... um, Emma's insecurities. Yes. Because she she feels that, in a sense, her husband, the guy she's met who's English, is a rugby coach, but he has to come back to England because he loses his job in Ireland. Yep. So, you know, he's back in, in, in his element back in Although England. Although he's insecure too, not yeah. in the relationship, but in his new job. In his new job. But she's really insecure in the relationship mm. because he's very good looking, he's very physical, she feels inferior physically, she feels that basically... Um, he could do much better, and therefore she's very prone to sexual jealousy. Mm. It's interesting, actually. I, I just finished reading the book when I read that story that was in all the papers this year about the woman who thinks that she might lose her husband simply because he, she thinks he's so much better looking than she is. She thinks she's a bit of a minger and uh, thinks that he's just far too good looking. She's punching, you know, above her weight. And what was very interesting was a psych- psychologist said that when people, particularly women, look at themselves in the mirror they degrade themselves by 20%. They think they're 20% less good-looking than they really are. And when they look at their partner, their male partner, they think that he's 20% better looking than he actually is. Oh, get so, you. So, well, isn't that fascinating? And so that would actually underpin this book, um, that actually there's a 40% imagined differential between the looks of the two of them in her mind. Poor women. Yes, poor We're women. How you almost. suffer for your we men. We are pathetic. <laughs> well, this book isn't pathetic. It's a really good summary. Mm. What is left when trust is gone is the slug line on the front cover. It's a great story, Sinead. Lovely to see you. Thank um, you. Delighted to be here. Well, as you know, um, we know a lot of writers, obviously, because of the book club, and there are those that we fervently wish their publishers would submit their works to the Richard and Judy Book Club because we think that they sh- would have a, a, a valued place on the list. And you're absolutely a textbook ha, case in point. <laughs> um, just, just give us a summary of, of the plot line and then we can get into it. The book is basically about trust. Um, it's about trust within a marriage and... It's a couple who he has lost his job and they have to move to London. And from so Ireland. From, from Ireland, Ireland sorry. Yeah. So their their marriage is under a little bit of strain. They've got young children, as all marriages are. They go, it has ups and downs. At the moment, they're on a bit of a down. And they move to London anyway, and they're trying to settle in. And he starts getting texts from an anonymous number. And really what I wanted to explore was the idea of a marriage that's already under a little bit of strain. If you drop a tiny amount of doubt into that marriage, how it can explode mm. and cause a huge amount of problems and also you know when a, se- when a seed of doubt is planted in a marriage you know you believe you believe your partner to a certain extent but the texts keep coming and they keep coming and he keeps saying he doesn't know who they're from but you know she begins to doubt obviously but the thing is emma who i, I thought was great she has a big flaw she is she's got a jealous streak as wide as the thames i mean we see that quite early on in the book she's always on the lookout for the girls who might be making a, a play for her very very attractive very handsome husband so she, she's, she's already primed to be jealous isn't she well i think she feels um 
that in a way she married up. I think you know people are always telling her how <laughs> handsome and charming her English husband is, and I think she kind of feels like she, that she was very lucky to get him. And I think mm -hmm. in a way that slightly puts her on the back foot all through all throughout their relationship. Her in a way, yeah. well, you know, people make her feel like that. He doesn't. But other people do, and I think in a way, you know, I mean, I've seen relationships like this, and the, the person is slightly on the back foot all the time, and so therefore she probably is a little bit more paranoid than other people, mm. you know. But I think a lot of women and men are a little bit paranoid. And the texts that that that, that uh, this person is sending um, are quite sexy, um, and mm. it escalates beyond text, doesn't it? Things are start being sent through the post. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it starts off with, with text and then I thought it would be interesting if the stalker started stalking her as well mm -hmm. because it could be, adds a whole other dimension to it. Um, it sounds very creepy. There are obviously light moments in it, oh, but sorry, I, did, I did want, I kind of wanted it to be something that like absolutely consumes their whole life and it's, it's like the person is inside their house mm -hmm. and it's inside their heads. And it's really about, you know, you trust somebody implicit, implicitly and you marry them and they've had a very difficult time having children and they have this lovely family that they've created. But suddenly something happens and really everything that they believed in is suddenly hmm. not, not as it seems. What I liked very much about it was um, kind of the, the you that gets into the book because you, you came across and lived in, in England for a while, didn't you? Um, did, yeah. Some years ago. And, and this is her first time living in, in England. What, what is that like for someone who's proud to be Irish um, uh, and is very happy to be over in this country? What's it like to uproot from a, a very different culture, a very different way of life there? And we, we, I think we overlook that a little bit and coming to a totally different kind of um, dimension here in London. Well, I couldn't wait to get away, to be honest, because... Uh, <laughs> but it's a really funny, all the reasons I, I left... to get away from Ireland or London? Yeah, to get away no, from Ireland. All the reasons I left are all the reasons I ended up moving back home. I mean, I lived here for seven incredibly happy years. Um, I wanted to get away. I felt Ireland was too small. Everybody knows everybody. I wanted to be anonymous, but believe me, being anonymous be wears off. Anonymous. Nobody <laughs> wants to oh be God, anonymous. Judy. <laughs> you don't know her very well, do you? <laughs> How funny. My mother, I can hear my mother laughing now. Um, no, anonymous. But that, obviously, being anonymous wears off after a while. But what I found really interesting was I moved into this apartment block and I used to smile and nod at everybody in the lift and everyone just used to ignore me. Ah. I thought it was really peculiar and they were like, oh, Jesus, here she is. But I thought it was really odd, but then I just realised that that's just the way people are. You know, mm. it's very transient here, it's very different. But once I got a job, I found it lonely in the beginning, I have to be honest. But once I got a job and I met people through work, obviously, and then I had a ball and I loved it and I was very, very sad to leave, actually. Uh, were you writing then or did you start writing when you got back to Ireland? No, I was writing for a magazine about printing presses. So I spent a lot of time in <laughs> industrial estates in Germany staring at cogs. So I thought, I'm actually going to go out of my mind if I don't write something creative. So in my spare time, I was tip-tapping away. And then I joined uh, just a bog standard creative writing course in Maida Vale, mm -hmm. and the tutor was very encouraging. At the time, I was struggling with infertility, and I thought I'd write a comedy about infertility. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just timing is the essence. Mm -hmm. and I think I was very lucky. It was the well, right you, time. You mentioned your mum and how she would laugh at the idea that I thought maybe you once wanted to be a nun. <laughs> but your mum actually was a writer, wasn't mm -hmm. she? Yeah. And she yeah. really inspired you. Uh, you. You say that you used to sort of see her writing at the kitchen table. And you always knew that when you grew up, this would be your ambition to write novels. Yeah, I think I was really lucky. My mum is, is my absolute hero. Um, it's been an inspiration to me all my life and she just, you know, she never got the chance to go to college so she did an open university course and then she sat down and she sort of decided she was going to write a book. She was going to write about Irish historical figures because she was appalled at the fact that myself, my sister and brother knew so little about Irish historical figures. So she wrote books for children on James Joyce and Yeats and Grainne Well. And so I suppose I was very lucky that I saw it could be done. She tried mm. and she failed and she tried and she failed and then she finally got published. Mm. So I think I was very lucky because I saw that it could be done and, you know, it sounds cliched, English was my favourite subject, I loved writing essays mm. and all that. But I didn't really have the confidence until I was 30 actually. Mm. I, I, it was my 30th birthday and I went, if I don't try now, I'm just never going to do it. Mm. And so that's kind of how it all started really. Well, unlike a nun, you have children. Um, <laughs> and unlike a nun, but in the literary sense, you're, you're fecund. I mean, you pump out books all the time. How many books do you write, say, over a five-year period? Is it, is it uh, one a year? A book a year. Yeah. A book a year. Yeah. You're very disciplined, aren't you? I am, but I love it. You know, someone was saying that, and I mean, I love it. Like, I cannot wait for my kids to go to school. I just run to my desk, step over all the mess, and just <laughs> rat a tat tat do don't, don't you get sort of... Um, I, I mean, I, I find this, not having been a writer all my life, only having been a, a, a writer very lately in my life, um, that it does require an awful lot of discipline to, to sit down and write. I mean, when I'd rather be sort of chatting, you know, washing going the car out. Even. Yeah, well, yeah. no, not washing the car, Richard. I would draw the line at that. But 
Yeah. Nevertheless, I do find it quite difficult because I'm not a lifelong writer. And that, it's never been a problem for you. You, you. you settle down and do it and... Well, you see, I just feel... First of all, I suppose I don't have all that much time, so I have to be very focused on the time because I have. Because of the children. It's school time, that's what yeah, I have. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think that, kind of, that will also focus your mind as well. But second of all, I just feel really blessed. I've turned my passion into a job. Mm. And so, you know, I look around and everyone around me is very stressed at the moment. Things are very tricky in Ireland. And I just feel so blessed that A, I don't commute. B, I do a job that I absolutely love. And, you know, I think for somebody with small kids and a very busy life to switch off for five hours a day into my own little world, I don't think about anything, I don't worry about anything. Mm. I just think that's just and, a privilege. And do you never get the dreaded writer's block? You, you never sort of feel stuck? Well, that's when I buy stuff online. <laughs> <laughs> That's when people with helmets arrive. My husband goes, yeah, there's another guy here with the helmet. <laughs> and the package. Um, that's so that's, that's, that's my day. I, sh I should but, say, as you, as you crack that, that, that small joke, that your books are very funny as well. Um, I think the first one I read of yours was, about six years ago, was um, Whose Life Is It Anyway? Yeah. Which had a very serious theme to it, a very yeah. serious theme, but was shout out loud funny. And this is no exception. You. you are very, very witty. Um, was, was your mother a, a funny writer as well? Was she, was she straight? Um, well, no, she, she wrote straight books, obviously, about, about the Irish historical figures, but she is very entertaining in her own way, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this, this book is no exception. I'm just, as I said at the beginning, I'm just delighted that it's, uh, it's, it's on this year's uh, list of recommended summer reads. It's Mad About You by Sinead Moriarty, and uh, it's a perfect summer read. You'll love it. And because we are mad about you, we've got lots of bonus content just for you in the back of your WH Smith copies. And here's some more of that bonus content. Seeing my book on the shelves of WH Smith is truly a dream come true. I spent seven incredibly happy years living in London and I spent a lot of time in WH Smith staring at other people's books. And honestly, I never thought that I'd be lucky enough to be on the shelf of WH Smith. So it is an absolute dream come true and a joy. And even though this is my ninth book, it never ever gets old. In fact, it gets more exciting and you appreciate it even more, I think, because you know how hard it is and how much competition there is out there. Writing for me is 100% my passion and to have been able to turn my passion into a job is a privilege that I never take for granted. So when my kids go to school, I literally shove them out the door and run to my desk because those precious hours mean a lot to me. And when I'm writing, I'm calm, I'm happy and I don't think about any woes or troubles or anything else that's going on in my life. I step over the laundry, I step over the dirty dishes, I really don't care. I just get to my desk as fast as I can and disappear into the wonderful world in my head. Finishing a book is its kind of a mixed blessing because first of all, you might think it's finished but your editor probably doesn't. Second of all, I've learned that. This is my ninth book, so I've learned that even though I think it's finished, it probably isn't, and it's probably going to come back with lots and lots and lots of suggestions. Um, but there is kind of a feeling of elation because you've got to the finishing line. It's a bit like running a marathon. You start off extremely enthusiastic. You think your idea is absolutely brilliant. Halfway through, you think it's rubbish. You can't believe you started it. What in God's name were you thinking? And then you see the finishing line and you charge to the end. Um, so a first draft is only a first draft, but it is much easier to edit a first draft than to edit nothing. So there is a sense of elation. There's also kind of a sense of saying goodbye um, to the characters who have been, although it might sound a bit cheesy, they have been your friends and your companions for probably nine months to a year. Well, hearing writers tell us how they work can be not only inspiring, but also reassuring, as nearly all of them have admitted what a challenge it can be getting the words that they want written down as they want them. The best piece of advice that I would give to a wannabe writer is to write and to read. And it's really as boring and trite and simple and important as that. That is it. That is the only magic formula. Sit down and write. Don't even worry about it being bad because a lot of writing is rewriting. So getting it down and finishing the book is the most important thing. And then everything else comes later. Follow your heart. Just follow your heart. If you really want to do it, if you're real, it's not just about writing, it's about life. Just do what your heart tells you. If you want to be a writer, be a writer. Knowing you've got to get something done by tomorrow or the following week or the following month forces you to work. And I think the very fact that you're forced to do it, adrenaline starts to pump through you and you see things that you wouldn't otherwise do. And so I like to write in a way that a journalist would, in a sort of mood of controlled panic. 
doesn't suit everybody, doesn't necessarily suit my publishers actually, uh, but it suits me. Well that's it, we're done for the summer collection but we'll be back very soon with some suggestions to get you through the autumn. Yes, thanks for tuning in and we hope you enjoyed the books, the podcasts and of course all the bonus content on the website. At richardandjudy.whsmith.co.uk